everybody, welcome to another video. Hope you're ready to flex those brain muscles. In this video, we're gonna talk about composite inverse trig function. So we're gonna look at stuff like this, which most students, including me, when you first see something like this, it's like, oh my God, I don't even know what's going on here, right? So the goal of this video is to do some examples, walk through some different scenarios and different possibilities of things we can see. And hopefully by the end of this video, you'll have a better understanding. So when you see something like this on homework, quiz, exams, something like that, you'll have be more confident and be able to take some steps and, and solve the problem. So let's go ahead and start by just figuring out what we're even looking at here, right? What am I looking at? So what I have here is a composite function, which is basically just a function within another function. My inner function is cosine four pi over three. My outer function is cosine inverse. So from what we know up to this point about inverse functions, is that if we take a function and plug it into its inverse, we get out x, right? Because the inverse function basically reverses everything the original function does. So it makes sense to think that, okay, I have a function, I'm plugging it into its inverse, I can just cross both these out, they cancel, and I'm left with four, five, or three, right? But the problem is that inverse trig functions in particular are very tricky. And the reason why is because I had to modify cosine to make it one-to-one, -one, so it would even have an inverse in the first place. So by doing that, I had to restrict the domain of cosine, which therefore restricts the range of cosine inverse. So I have a specific range I'm dealing with with cosine inverse, which is from zero to pi, right? So by looking at this, I can pretty quickly see that four pi over three is not between zero and pi. So if I just cross these out and wrote four pi over three, it would be incorrect because it's not within the range. Whatever this is, we're still looking for an angle because that's what inverse functions do, right? They take in a value and spit out an angle, basically the opposite of regular functions, which take in an angle and spit out a value, so it makes sense, right? So I'm still looking for an angle, but four pi over three is not within the range of cosine inverse, so I need to find a different angle that is within the range. So how can I do this? Well, luckily for this example, I know what cosine of four pi over three is. It's actually on the unit circle, and I can find it. So I can replace cosine four pi over three with what it equals, and then I can evaluate this. This is one of the more straightforward examples. They, most of them will not be like this, right? So what is co cosine of four pi over three? I don't have the unit circle memorized, but I know that four pi over three is in the third quadrant. I know that the reference angle is pi over three, so it's gonna be one half, but it's in the third quadrant, so it's gonna be negative. So we have negative one half. So cosine inverse of negative one half equals theta. And now hopefully this looks a little more familiar. We can switch theta and negative one half and write this as not an inverse function, write it as just cosine, right? This is like saying cosine of what angle gives me negative one half? But what's specific about this angle? Again, it has to be within this range. It has to be between zero and pi. So if I draw a little picture here, I'm dealing with zero to pi, so first or second quadrant. Since I have a negative, I know it's gonna be second quadrant. So I'm in the second quadrant and I have a reference angle of pi over three. So if I, let's see, I should redraw this. Pictures are the key to a lot of these, is drawing pictures, I highly recommend it. I do not do any of these examples without drawing a picture ever. So draw this, so again, I'm looking at a reference angle here of pi over three. So that means the angle between the x-axis and the terminal side of my angle is pi over three. That means the angle be between the initial side, like the actual angle itself I'm looking for is two pi over three, right? Because this is pi, I basically take pi and subtract pi over three. So my theta in this case is two pi over three, which, whoops, two pi over three, which I can confirm is within the range I'm looking for. Two pi over three is definitely between zero and pi, and it definitely gives me negative one half for cosine. So the solution to this is two pi over three. Hopefully that makes sense. All right, so now let's look at this example. Our inner function is sine of seven pi over five. Outer function is sine inverse. So again, we have to first check because if you look at this angle and you see that it is within the range of our outer function, our inverse function, then you can just cross out, cross out, write that as your answer, right? So that's the first step you usually always wanna take is double check, see if it is within that range, cross those out and that's your answer. But it's usually not gonna be because the instructors want you to know what to do when it's not. So it's probably not, and in this case it isn't because what is the range of sine inverse? It is from negative pi over two to pi over two, okay? From negative pi over two to pi over two, this is clearly bigger than pi over two. It is not within the range. So what do we do? Well, in this example, we looked on the unit circle 
But in this example, we do not know what sine of 7 power over 5 is. I have no way of finding that out without a calculator. So we have to do something different. So I know that this is going to be theta, right? I'm still looking for an angle because I have an inverse function. This is some value. It's spitting out some angle. That's how sine inverse works. So I'm looking for some angle. So couldn't I just do this step here? Couldn't I do this step? This is still some value. I could still say this is like saying sine of what angle equals sine of 7 power of 5. So that's exactly what I'm going to do in this next step. And i got to make a little room here. So that's exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to rewrite this as sine of what angle equals sine of 7 pi over 5. This angle has to be within negative pi over 2, and pi over 2 has to be within that range. Okay. So this angle I'm looking for is between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. Okay. So let me draw 7 pi over 5. 7 pi over 5 is where? It is in the third quadrant. Because we're going from 0 to pi. I can rewrite pi, if that makes more sense, as 5 pi over 5. Some people like having that common denominator. Because then I can see that this is 2 pi over 5 past 5 pi over 5, right? So this angle, which is happens to be the reference angle, is 2 pi over 5. The full angle is 7 pi over 5. So I'm looking for a value within the range of sine inverse, which is from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2, that has a reference angle of 2 pi over 5, and that gives me what? Well, I'm in the third quadrant, so this is going to be negative. So that gives me a negative. So what can I do? Well, first or fourth quadrant, those are my two options. Fourth quadrant gives me negative. First quadrant gives me positive. So I know that this theta is within this fourth quadrant, so it's between negative pi over 2 and 0. So what is in this quadrant with a reference angle of 2 pi over 5? That is negative 2 pi over 5. Okay, that's that angle there. I'm working backwards. And remember, we don't start here and go all the way around to the fourth quadrant. With sine inverse, we have to work backwards and work forwards. So that's a very common mistake is students will say, oh, fourth quadrant, and they'll wrap all the way around. No, you want to work backwards. That's how the inverse range works, right? So what is our solution? Well, theta equals negative 2, 2 pi over 5. Negative 2 pi over 5. So the key to really understanding this is being able to draw angles in standard position, being able to find reference angles and understand what they mean, and knowing what trig functions are positive and negative in which quadrants. So here I have negative 2 pi over 5. And let's get to a couple more examples and see some more problems. All right, so here's a couple more examples to finish up the video. I will be making a part two with more examples, so stay tuned for that. They'll be harder examples. For these, I encourage you to actually pause the video and try them on your own. If you get stuck or you want to check your answer, press play. So by now, hopefully you've pressed play and you have both these answers. Let's go ahead and do it. Let's look at this. Cosine inverse, that's our outer function. Our inner function is cosine of negative pi over five. So what's the first thing I always do is check to see if this angle is in the range of cosine inverse. So what is the range of cosine inverse? The range of cosine inverse is 0 to pi, okay? So this is clearly not between 0 and pi. So what's our second step? Well, we look to see if this is on the unit circle. If it is, we can evaluate this and then get something that's a little easier to deal with. It's not on the unit circle. So now what do we have to do? Well, we know we're going to get some angle out here. So I can write equals theta, and then I can use what I know about inverse functions to switch this input and this output. Right, so I draw an arrow here, and I know that this is like saying cosine of what angle equals cosine of negative pi over 5, right? So what I'm going to do is consider my range. I'll draw a little sketch of that, 0 to pi. So whatever this theta is, it's either in quadrant 1 or 2. So now let me look at this angle, negative pi over 5. I'll draw a sketch of that. I always draw as many pictures as I can. It really does help. Negative pi over 5, I'm starting here and I'm working backwards. My reference angle is pi over 5. I'm in the fourth quadrant, so I know this is a positive value. So since this is a positive value, I'm going to be in the first quadrant because cosine is positive in the first quadrant and negative in the second quadrant. So I've narrowed it down to first quadrant. So I'm in the first quadrant with a reference angle of pi over 5. That's simply just pi over 5, okay? So what are the two main things I look for? Reference angle and positive or negative, right? The sign. So those are the two main things I'm using to get my theta. So in this case, I have pi over 5. 
All right, so for this last example, it's a little different because our outer function is no longer an inverse function. We just have regular old sine out here, right? Our inner function is the inverse function now. So it's a little bit different because out here we're not getting an angle anymore. It's just a value because sine takes in an angle and spits out a value. Sine inverse takes in a value and spits out an angle. So this sine inverse is taking in this negative one half. It's going to spit out an angle. Then I'm going to take the sine of that angle, right? So what I can really do is start from the inside and work out. I can find what this angle is, replace sine inverse with that angle, and then take the sine of that angle. So that's what I'm going to go ahead and do. So sine inverse of negative one half is like saying sine of what angle? Oh, my marker's dying on me. Sine of what angle equals negative one half? But the problem is my theta has to be between negative pi over two and pi over two. So I just to make sure I stay within that range of sine inverse. So negative pi over two and pi over two. And since sine is negative, I know I'm gonna be in the fourth quadrant between negative pi over two and zero, right? Let's see, a reference angle of pi over six gives me these one halves I'm looking for. And since I'm between negative pi over two and zero with a reference angle of pi over six, that means I'm starting here at zero and working backward to pi over six, which gives me negative pi over six for theta. So this theta is negative pi over six, which means sine inverse of negative one half is negative pi over six, which means I can replace this with negative pi over six. So I have sine of negative pi over six, which equals what? That equals negative one half, right? So do we notice a pattern here? Yes, there is actually a shortcut. There is a shortcut. I can, in this case, just cross these out, right? I couldn't in this case, because I had to make sure it's within the range of inverse sine. Okay, but our range of sine is not restricted, right? Our range of sine, that just gives us values, okay? So in this case, we're not really too worried. All we have to do is make sure that whatever's inside this sine inverse, right, this inner function, that whatever's inside here is obviously in the domain of sine inverse. So if I had like negative two or something in here, then I'd rewrite it as sine theta equals negative two, which is never possible. So if we have something like that, then we have no solution. But other than that, we can just cross them out if we have just a regular function on the outside and an inverse on the inside. But if you're ever confused, if you're ever like, I'm not sure if I can just cross it out or not, always work this out. This really didn't take too long. So if you wanna take every step, you can absolutely do that. But that is a good general shortcut for these. So in part two, stay tuned. I'll do some more examples. We'll get to more, some more challenging examples where we have cosine and tangent, right? Like two different functions that we have to draw a triangle and do all that fun stuff. So stay tuned for that. But hopefully this video helped. If you have questions or comments, suggestions, any of that, leave them below. Hit the like button and hit subscribe if you enjoyed. Check out my channel and keep flexing those brain muscles. See you in the next video.